Greetings, everyone. I'm Joanne Marquetta, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency's Executive Director, and I'm speaking from Lake Tahoe, one of the most spectacular places on planet Earth and the ancestral home of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. I am so honored to be closing out this incredible spring forum. I sense that we've come together as practitioners of landscape scale conservation because it's apparent that our systems, all of them, environmental, economic, social, are all in the throes of chaos. And the signals are all there calling for truly transformative change in our worldview. Today, I want to talk about a passion of mine and my life's work since coming to Tahoe. And it's the practice of understanding and delivering on systems change one of the topics that's been underpinning this forum series. The geography where I practice is Lake Tahoe, located high in the Sierra Nevada mountains and straddling the state lines of California and Nevada. Our lake is 22 miles long, 12 miles wide, with 39 trillion gallons of the clearest, cleanest alpine mountain water, and it's an international icon. And it has been my crucible and practice ground for understanding the mysteries and difficulties and satisfactions of changing systems. It's 500 square miles of watershed with 55,000 residents ranging from the severely impoverished literally to billionaires. 90% of it is federal and state public land, five counties, one city, about 12 small local communities, the Washoe Tribe's homeland, and thousands of organizations and stakeholders. The Tahoe Regional Planning Agency's mission runs the full gamut from transportation and land use regulation to recreation, forest health, invasive species programs, air and water quality plans, and that's, that's just for starters. The work is to make all parts of the overall Tahoe region system work together as a whole. And when I took the job 15 years ago, I said, how hard can it be? And I have been truly humbled by 15 years of complex collaborative landscape level systems change work. And I'm drawn to landscape conservation practice because of its potential to fundamentally change the interplay of earth and human interactions and in the process to change us and how we see the world. So from our diversity of perspectives, we are all, each of us knowingly or not, systems change agents. We're leading a movement and that movement shows the world another way, another form of leadership, not grounded in top-down power over predetermined solutions, but collaborative, power with and power to leadership with roots in shared meaning, shared power, cooperation, and the interdependence of all of us. And the real work of our movement is in constantly reweaving our webs, rediscovering all of our needed and lost connections to put our systems back together and to reconnect ourselves to the whole, all of us, and earth systems to one another. And boy, we need that now more than ever. I offer my thoughts with humility and from my own deep learning from both successes and mistakes that I've made along the way. And as I go, I'm gonna draw on a few examples from Tahoe to give meaning to the ideas that I wanna share. You know, among life's paradoxes is the certainty of change. It's odd then that we humans actually fear change. Our attachment to order and stability is kind of our human confusion about how natural systems change. How many of us though have made our greatest growth out of crisis. So our calling is to know how to think in systems and to lead change and specifically systems change. Danella Meadows in her book, Thinking in Systems quoted an ancient Sufi teaching that captures the mindset needed to actually think about systems. And it says this, you think 
that because you understand one, you must understand two because one and one makes two. But you must also understand and. So we simply don't understand the whole by seeing only its parts. Much more important is working with and. That's the connections and the relationships among the parts. And when we do this, new ideas that can actually change the world become possible. At Tahoe, our system and its first connections were defined for us 50 years ago. It was the middle of last century and Lake Tahoe's watershed became increasingly polarized over a threat of overdevelopment. Our mountain marshes, our wetlands, our meadows were all being lost to poorly planned development. It was high rise casinos and housing and businesses and lodging uh, for the 1960 Olympics and roads and more. So that by the late 1960s, California and Nevada lawmakers signed a bi-state compact into law to create my organization, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. And that compact set a new regional government boundary. The Tahoe watershed was the boundary because no single jurisdiction could steward the lake and its ecosystems on its own. So implicit in that boundary, the visionaries acknowledged the need even then to think in systems. So in large landscape scale work, to think in systems is our prime directive. But how do we key into the needed connections to see a whole system in its larger context? Because since Newton and the enlightenment, we've been trained to look only at parts, to analyze really small details, more and more details. Details never reveal the wholeness of the system and to bring wholeness into view, we're learning to zoom out, to look for the big picture, to sense forces, larger forces at play. And these seemingly small events offer these quiet clues to the underlying dynamics of a hidden context that it's all connected. At TRPA, we intentionally tap those clues. We meet as a team once a week on Monday mornings or something we call weekly report. And most interesting always are the local happenings of note. And as a shorthand, we call it situational awareness. We tune into system-wide influences by learning to notice small details that may hold meaning. And then we scale these up to understand the shapes and behaviors, the emerging dynamics of the system in its motion. And with that perspective, these profound new insights about the system's boundaries start to become available to us. A recent example shows the power in seeing the whole system context. The simple process of our Monday report meeting spawned a new region-wide initiative on sustainable recreation. And we're now organizing around private interests as well as dozens of public recreation land managers in our, in our complex watershed. Until recently, remarkably so at Tahoe, despite having a $5 billion tourism-based economy, we had never organized ourselves and our outdoor recreation and visitation trends. Last summer during COVID, we started to see locals picketing at our roundabouts entering our small communities, they were telling visitors, go home. And we saw new and unprecedented levels of litter and illegal parking. And we saw this flagrant disregard of our fire danger with illegal campfires in the back country. And so we had to scale up those supposedly separate details that we observed and they were signs and made larger connections into this first ever initiative on sustainable recreation for Tahoe. Not only now are there new relationship connections, but it's more connected. There's more connected communication, coordination, consistency all across the watershed. And our visitors bureaus have joined wholeheartedly, shifting their approach from destination marketing to destination management. So now we're starting to build a new, a new tourism coalition with the visitors bureaus actually leading the way. We were really fortunate because we already had many, not all, but many of the relationships 
that we needed to get going fast. We all know that relationship is the lifeblood of collaborative landscape practice, and we neglect or omit connecting with key partners at our peril. The quality of our outcomes can almost be predicted by how we attend to those relationships. And key is connecting up fragments, organizations that are focused only on a specific part of a problem, but they're yet to have been connected um, on, the, on the working other parts. Without those connections, progress can be really elusive. If relationships are the system's glue, when we see the systems break down, we can bet there are broken or missing relationships. Sometimes in Dahu, we learn and adapt really slowly. Um, for 30 years at Tahoe, we neglected cultivating good relationships. Decades ago, TRPA clung to its turf. We were isolated and to the exclusion of all others. We'd drawn a system boundary, the watershed, and we treated it just like a political boundary. We put in place regional environmental standards and we decided we would be the boss of all. And in keeping, that was in keeping with the preferred environmental approach at the time, which was command and control regulation. And by the 1990s, the lake wasn't improving. And we had to acknowledge regulation alone didn't restore an ecosystem. So rigid turf and command and control spawned enemies and dissonance and outrage and anger. And the louder that we said, I'm the boss of you, the louder others said, no, you're not. And we had to admit our silo was maybe bigger, bigger, but no better. And we had to move from my way to our way. And we needed a different approach to harmonize our differences, a set of programs to correct the problems of the past, to restore the watershed, to repair the damage done to each part of the system. And we had to actually change course to change that system, we had to build the voluntary coalitions of the willing. Why, why would others want to necessarily connect with us? Discovering the scope of our shared meaning across so many fragmented interests was the essential task in remaking how we related to one another. C. West Churchman was the one who said, a systems approach begins when first you see the world through the eyes of another. And the most powerful leverage point in changing a system is shifting a purpose so that others can see themselves in it. Fragmented issues can then attach to a shared agenda and more diverse others can then find ground for their own connection. Shared meaning is the force that pulls order out of the chaos of fragmented parts and relationships. And this is also where our shared leadership and power sharing starts in it. Each of us has to ask, what power are we willing to give up in order to connect and in service of what higher purpose? So change is possible only if we find shared meaning and make that shared meaning available and desirable. Tahoe's shared meaning became the bi-state and federal compact agreement, the regional plan, and a multi-billion dollar capital investment program that implemented all of it. And what we envisioned in the mid 1990s was one of the largest landscape scale programs in ecosystem restoration in the nation. The Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program or what we call the EIP was born it's a shared capital investment program for restoring Lake Tahoe. And while it called out in our plan, while it was called out in our plans to achieve our adopted regional environmental standards, the EIP was wholly voluntary. And yet over two decades, our EIP partners have implemented more than 700 projects to improve water and air quality and forest health and recreation and fish and wildlife habitat capital improvements were made where our partners could see themselves in the shared purpose. And the shared meaning was not being told what to do. 
It was an invitation to add diverse goals to the big picture. So over 25 years, we've secured and invested more than $2.4 billion from every sector, private as well as public, in our congressional elected delegations. They always wanted to know who stood with us in our network. And we've achieved it all through something that I call epic collaboration. Okay, if the first system change mindset is to think differently about parts and holes, then the next is to think about networks. Single organizations don't change a system, yet we've all experienced that our mother organizations can cling to their silos and go it alone. How then do we build a network? Well, we blur our boundaries. You leave behind the imaginary formal organization and you learn to work with the real organization, the dense network of interdependent relations, just like this group, the California Landscape Stewardship Network. The network works on top of our formal organizations and we learn to look elsewhere for the potential for change, not in functions and roles on any organization chart, but in the quality of the energy of the interaction that happens across organizational boundaries. So collaborative governance then is not groups of organizations, but rather groups of connections. It's the and between everything. Tahoe's network formed around the EIP and today we work with more than 80 partners at every level, local, state, federal, Washer tribe, scientists, research, nonprofit, private sector, philanthropy. Um, this partnership is working together to achieve the common goals of our regional plan and the EIP. And it all sounds blissful, blissfully positive, doesn't it? No surprise, it is not always. And in working with the web of relations, when the web breaks, and it will, we reweave it and we restore it to health by connecting it to more of itself. So our EIP partnership was not an explicit call out of the compact. We built the voluntary overlay of multi-sector governance with a nine seat steering committee that's co-chaired by TRPA and the US Forest Service. And we've memorialized that informal governance through a written charter with multi-agency working groups for all sorts of different programs. So it's here in the network where our JEDI work, our justice, equality, diversity, diversity and inclusiveness, where it actually takes form. Since the 1990s, the Washoe tribe has been a signatory to the Tahoe Partnership Charter. The tribe has a seat in our formal governance, sitting on TRPA's advisory planning commission and it, the tribe participates in our informal network governance as well. It's one of nine representatives on our interagency steering committees. Above all, one thing stands out, and that is that building relationships and making and remaking connections and adjusting shared meaning, it never ends. Even after 25 years, we're continuing to create new and better relationships and find new common ground. So, so far, we've better connected up the parts to the whole, the unifying purpose, the people and their relationships. Now let me talk about how we connect up our ideas to generate change. How do we actually think together and make decisions on shared purpose? And when we think together, how do we know the time is right for change? for our unconventional idea. It's another paradox. We sense the right time to move on an issue. It's often when there is the most disequilibrium in, any part, in, a, in a part of the system, you seize that opening and you walk through the door. There'll be small, often imperceptible signals like the situational awareness that led to the new coalition and it'll whisper, now's the right time. And it tells you the system is primed for a shift. And I've learned that chaos and disequilibrium is a necessary condition for a system's growth. 
and the barriers are simply part of it. They're not an indication of dysfunction. I saw an article recently that masterfully described this approach and it labeled it as being a diplomatic rebel. And the diplomat is generous and balancing, balances her ideas that challenge the existing practices with backing for others, different perspectives. And she builds bridges with those who can support the progress of change. And she uses language that shows respect for others' concerns and creates narratives that can appeal to champions and give her purpose the credibility and the resources and the encouragement she needs to succeed. And then to be the diplomatic rebel, we also understand well the ecosystem dynamics and the rules, both written and unwritten, that we very intentionally plan to transgress. TRPA just successfully concluded a four-year diplomatic rebellion, remaking the implementation of Tahoe's transportation systems. And once we introduced our new ideas, we let them churn in the middle of this crucible of more and better process. There were more eyes, more viewpoints. We, the quality of the engagement mattered more than the outcome. And we made new ideas real for stakeholders by giving them a personal opportunity to actually interact with the creation of the new parts of the system. And we learned to live with the disequilibrium for years so that others could actually support the progress of change. So now let me go to what I've been dancing around pretty much all day. We, we can't work collaboratively if our mindset or our organizational culture stops us. And this brings us then to the messiness of being human. It's us. Our, ver our own very human behaviors can be the greatest obstacle because we resist change that feels threatening to the self. So what do we do? In order to be collaborative, we have to turn the catchphrase of collaboration into reality across multiple levels, the organization, the individual, and the network as a whole. And the capstone of collaborative leadership is influence. It's not authority. So we can't make anyone be collaborative. And the challenge then is that all organization and groups of people have a culture. Those are all the beha recurring behaviors, the repertoire of values and practices that underpin our daily work. And culture is present whether or not we're explicit about recognizing it. Most of us inherit our inflexible organizational cultures, especially in government, where rigid, constrained rules and protocols control the possibilities. Those controls foster entrenched employee and stakeholder behaviors that stifle the lifeblood of creativity and change. And it's why Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So how do you change an organizational culture from within? You don't proclaim it. You don't proclaim the change from the top and then hope. You do though help influence people to change the way they think and behave in this Enter, and we enter culture building. And culture change is changing hearts and minds. It's the most difficult and most formidable aspect of changing a system because it deals fundamentally with changing human behavior, one person at a time. 15 years ago, when I came to TRPA, we suffered from a my way or the highway culture. Do it because I said so. And although we had willing, passionate staff who were committed to the mission, we were having such difficulty delivering on anything. And we very intentionally changed the culture by reorienting everyone's mindset. We made a 180 degree change by anchoring to a new bedrock value. That value, partnership. We set a goal to become the very best at partnership and collaboration, both internally and externally. 
And then we changed every operating system, every external communication, every engagement to align with that value right down to creating more physical teamwork space. And we broadcast that value far and wide, loudly outside of TRPA and inside. And at first, no one believed us. I made speeches, we invited new partnerships, we made our permit process helpful and flexible instead of officious and rigid. And we engaged new collaborative process everywhere. And slowly but surely, the change took hold. And those who preferred the old regulatory command and control they left and others integrated the new value and ways of behavior. Building collaborative culture is a journey and we continue to support daily the core value of epic collaboration in everything that we do everywhere all the time. It's our North Star and the results show in what we can accomplish and in our policy achievements. And it's become the backbone, the solid ground on which the rest of the network can actually build. So I spoke of culture change at the organizational level. What about the rest of the network? That comes as we work on ourselves individually as collaborative landscape practice leaders and influencers. We ourselves have to walk our own talk with strong communication and listening and empathy skills, having the vocal courage with humility to navigate ambiguous and chaotic situations, being respectful and generous and curious we start by changing ourselves because when we change, we influence the people connected with us to change in alignment with our field of influence. And the most difficult field of influence is changing the whole of the network itself consistently across all organizations and entities. And here, collaborative leadership is much more than our own individual qualities. How do we get others to change with us? This is where we as collaborative leaders create this collective field of influence by connecting our own with others collaborative behaviors. We guide people to make sense of collective challenges, no matter how complex or ambiguous. We don't rely upon what's worked in the past. We test entirely new approaches. We solve problems by creating connections and engaging people and taking a systems approach. And we achieve impact by developing strategy that aligns self-interest with collective values. We bring more and more collaborative connections into our field of collaborative influence. And we continuously weave and reweave our web of influence as the network grows and changes. Creating that field of collaborative influence is extraordinarily demanding work. Not everyone will be willing to participate. That's okay. Persevere. The system is adaptive. It'll adjust itself around the recalcitrant few. We face this now in Tahoe. Some don't know how to collaborate well, no matter how much coaching, no matter how much encouragement. Some are fearful of losing turf. Those are all universal conditions and that's why leadership matters. Our role as leader influencers is to help make collaborative leaders of others. So, in, so this is, in my humble opinion, the work of systems change and collaborative leadership as I've experienced it. It's extraordinarily difficult work and we can find solace and satisfaction though in realizing that collaboration is a group exercise. We don't have to go alone. And if we connect ourselves as we've talked today and we learn from one another, we can combine our skills as a collective, a connected powerhouse leading a movement for positive change. And then we become the proverbial village capable of great outcomes. So I wish us all well on our respective collaborative journeys to the ultimate destination of turning my way into our way. It's truly been a privilege and I thank you all. Take care.